worthy of praise. I will follow.
Lift him up tonight. Give him praise. We exalt you tonight, Father. We lift our hands in praise to you. We lift you up on high, for you are worthy of our praise. We love you tonight. We praise you tonight. We exalt your holy name, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are wonderful. You are the counselor. You are the mighty God. We exalt you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you clap your hands, make a joyful noise. He is worthy of our praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. We just want to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Amen. Special prayer request tonight for all of our children in Sunday school. Amen. Not only for our Sunday school kids, but also for our youth department. Let's all remember them in prayer tonight. Amen. As they get ready to go back to school, that God will be with them, that God will protect them. Amen. And that they would be a witness and a lighthouse in their schools. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of you have a prayer request? Lift your hand to the Lord. He knows that every need here tonight. It just about everybody's got something. Let's ask God to meet these needs. Father, we humbly come before you tonight. Lord, you are our help in the time of trouble. You are our refuge and our strength. We ask you tonight, God, to meet every one of these needs that is here tonight. You know every heart's request. You know every, you know every request that's been in this house tonight, God, whether it's physical or financial or spiritual or whatever the need may be. We ask you to take power and dominion and authority, Lord. We ask you tonight, God, to be with our children as they go back to school, that your angels would have charge round about them, that you would protect them as they go. Lord, that you would encamp around about them, that your angels, hallelujah, protect them from all harm and protect them from all danger tonight. I pray, God, that you would use our children to be a witness and a lighthouse in their schools, God. Hallelujah. Open doors and give them opportunity to share the gospel, I pray. Help them to exalt you. Help them to praise you. Help them to glorify your mighty name. Meet every need tonight, God, we pray. For we realize it's not by our might or our power but it's by your spirit in the name of Jesus. Will you give him some praise? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing. Thank you for answering our prayer. Thank you for being faithful to us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Turn around and greet somebody tonight. Tell them you're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. everybody here on a Thursday night and it's so great to fellowship with our fellow members in Christ amen as you get seated I have a couple of announcements for you you can take out your calendars we will be having Purpose Institute it starts tomorrow and Saturday so please come out there are some great courses prepared um, we'd really like a great, strong showing of our church body there. So please come sign up for a course. It's still not too late and be a part of what God's doing in our church. There will be a special ladies' lunch.
luncheon. This will be taking place on September 7th, run by our very own Sister Overton. Um, we are having Missionary Smoke from Tanzania. She's going to come and minister to us ladies. So please come out, be a part of that. Lunch will be provided, um, and I know that God has something in store for that event. And then finally, on September 15th, save the date for All Nations Sunday. Again, come dressed in um, clothes representing the country of your choice. And donate a dish. If you'd like to donate something, please see Sister Bleedy. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Purpose Institute, tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. You won't want to miss it, amen. Then on Saturday, beginning at 8 o'clock, there's a class at 8 o'clock. There's a class at 1030 and another class at 130. So come out and be a part of Purpose Institute, amen. Praise God. The ushers are coming. I think they're coming. Hallelujah. Let us stand together. We're going to pray over the offering. Amen. Ask God to bless the offering tonight. Father, we love you. We're grateful for all that you have done. Thank you for your power in our lives. For truly, God, without you, we can do nothing. Hallelujah. You are our help. You are our health. You are our strength and our salvation. We just give you praise and we give you honor and glory for all your blessings. I pray tonight, Lord, bless the gift and the giver as we come and give in appreciation for all that you have already given to us. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody again say amen. Come and give to the Lord. Give God the praise. Feels good to be in your house, Lord. Feels good to feel your presence in our lives. There's nothing I like better than feeling the power and the presence of God. Can you say amen? Amen. And good to see all of you in the house of the Lord tonight. Praise God. And I'd like to give a special welcome to Brother Solomon. Glad to have him back with us. He used to be a, a member of our church on 4th Street when we were in Laurel. Amen. And I'm glad he's found us here. Amen. God bless him and his family. Hope you'll go by and shake his hand and make him feel at home. Amen. Hallelujah. We are studying the book of Romans. So I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 6, amen, and we're going to begin at verse number 9, praise God, and as you're turning there, just quickly, I told you last time that we were here, we had to take a little break for vacation Bible school, amen, but we, I kind of got carried away and uh, didn't quite cover as much as what I had hoped to, amen, but the book of Romans chapter 6 is divided into two categories, 
verse 1 through 14 addresses us being dead to sin and alive to God. Dead to sin and alive to God. Aren't you glad you're dead to sin? And then verses 15 through 23 covers being free from sin and becoming a slave of righteousness. Amen. I serve him because I want to, not because I have to. Aren't you glad that you're a servant of righteousness tonight? Amen. Praise God. So we're going to begin with verse number 8, Romans 6 and 8. He says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Can you say praise the Lord? You can be seated in Jesus' name. So Paul restates a truth telling us that our identification with Jesus Christ and his death results in our identification with him being alive. Amen. That if I know him, that if I die with him, I shall also live with him. Amen. That's talking about being dead to sin and alive unto God. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, the Bible tells us, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You believe that tonight? I'm crucified with Christ. And if I'm crucified with Christ, I'm dead to sin. Hallelujah. But Christ liveth in me. So just as Christ was raised from the dead, we become alive unto Christ. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Verse 9 says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, that death hath no more dominion over him. Amen. We know that the Bible tells us that when he died on the cross, they laid him in the tomb, and he went down to hell before he went up to heaven. The scripture says that he went down to hell and took the keys to death, hell, and the grave from the devil. And then he ascended up on high, amen, and eventually he was risen into heaven, amen. The Bible tells us that he's become our high priest. So the difference between the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of everybody else is recorded in Scripture. And the difference is that every other person raised from the dead in the Bible, had to experience death a second time. Amen. A second time. And Jesus did not. His resurrection was final. He will never again have to die. Amen. He did it once and for all, the Bible tells us. So in this sense, he is the firstborn and has become the firstfruits from the dead. Amen. There's never before him was there anybody ever born again, but he became the firstborn from the dead. Amen. So Paul explains his point to the relationship of sin to the believer after the believer's identification with Christ and his death. He says, death no longer has dominion over him. So when we identify with Christ in his death, death no longer has dominion over us. That does not mean that we won't die. Amen? Because the Bible is clear that it's appointed unto man to die. Amen? But death has no more dominion over us in the fact that just as Death has no more power over Jesus Christ, 
So the sin nature no longer has power over the believer because we are dead to sin. So sin has no more power over you. It cannot control you any longer if you're dead to sin. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. So when I die to my sins, amen, when I'm crucified with Christ, I die. Amen. But just as Jesus was raised from the dead, I shall live for eternity, so I'm made alive by, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, if I don't die to sin, sin always has power over me. But now that I'm dead to sin, sin no longer has power over me. The devil cannot make you sin. The demons cannot make you sin. Your neighbor can't make you sin. Nobody can make you sin, but you have to allow sin to reign. So if you belong to the Lord, you've got power. Power now over sin. Amen. Before Jesus Christ came into our lives, we did not have power over, this, over sin. But now that Christ reigns in us, we now have power. He said, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. I've got power over sin because of Jesus Christ. So I do not have to sin any longer. You know, people say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, if you're a Christian, the devil can't make you do it. Amen. He has no power over you. Now, that is not to say that you are incapable of sinning. Because Paul clearly tells us, to whomever we yield our members to, we become the servant thereof. If I yield myself to the devil or unrighteousness, I become the servant of sin. But if I yield myself as a servant of righteousness, I become the servant of God. And we have enough power in us, the gift of the Holy Ghost, to not to yield to temptation, not to yield to the things of this world, but we have power and we have dominion and we have authority over sinfulness. So I don't have to sin a little bit every day. And when we do things that are contrary to the word of God, we then become servants of sin. Hello, if I get angry and I start cursing, it isn't that sin had more power over me than God had, but I yielded my flesh to that sinful nature. Amen. But if I had have yielded to God, I wouldn't have cursed. I would have bit my tongue. Amen. So sin has no more power over us. Death has no more dominion over us. Just as Jesus Christ had power over death, hell, and the grave, he has power over our sin nature. Amen. So sin does not control us any longer. Can you say praise the Lord? Verse 10 says, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So Jesus, of course, had no sin nature. I'll say that again. Jesus had no sin nature. He was 100% God, and he was also 100% man or flesh. It was God and man reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. And so his 
he had no sin nature because he was already holy. Hallelujah. He is the Almighty. He is the great I Am. He is the Jehovah Jireh. He is the El Shaddai. Hallelujah. So sin had no power over him. That's why the devil came to him and said, If you'll, amen, bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. He didn't want need to bow down. He already was the king of the world. Praise God. So Jesus died because of our sin problem. Mankind has a sin problem. Hello. Mankind has a sin problem. You, you meet people and you say, oh, they're such a sincere person. But did you know you can be sincerely wrong? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I've met a lot of folks that says, well, they're not a bad person. You know, they do, they do this and they do that. They do good deeds and they run down the list of why they're so good. The fact that Adam sinned in the garden, amen, is enough that all of us have been born with a sin nature. And because of that sin in the garden, we have all sinned. And come short of the glory of God. And there is none righteous. No, not one. Amen. We all need a Savior. So we need to stop, amen, giving in to the doctrines of this world that says, Oh, well, you believe what you want to believe and I'll believe what I want to believe because we're all going to heaven anyway. That is a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there's one baptism. And there's only one way to heaven, and it's a straight way. Amen. And he said there'll be few that find it. And so if man does not take care of the sin problem, therefore he will be separated from God. So Jesus, he died as an offering for our sin. The whole reason he came to earth was to go to the cross and pay the penalty for your sin and to pay the penalty for my sin that we might have life tonight and that we might have it abundantly. So those who identify with Jesus Christ and his death in reference to to sin, enjoy freedom, hello, if I identify with him in his death, I enjoy freedom from sin's control over my body, hallelujah, and Jesus enjoys freedom from death, and the death of Jesus to sin was once and for all, the Bible says. So the reference then to Christ's resurrection by the glory of the Father has to do with the fact that the resurrection was affected by the power of God. The flesh was raised by the power of God. I don't, I don't have a long time. I'm going to try to hurry and finish this chapter tonight. But as the, when Jesus died and they laid him in the tomb, the Bible says he went down, hello, and the body, the spirit went down to, to hell. The body laid in the grave. And the Bible says he took from the devil the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and then he ascended back up. He re-entered the body. And he walked around for 40 days, and the disciples, amen, were witness that he was there. He said, touch me not, for I am not yet glorified. But he would then ascended into heaven, and we no longer see him as a man upon earth. Amen. And it says that that same spirit 
that quicken Jesus' mortal body is one day going to quicken our mortal body. Whoa, hallelujah. That same spirit, what same spirit? The spirit of Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Woo. Hallelujah. Do you think it's important to have the gift of the Holy Ghost? Because if you don't have the gift of the Holy Ghost, you do not have resurrecting power. So when they lay you in the grave, you will stay in the grave until Jesus calls you to the judgment. But if you're a child of God and they lay you in the grave, when Jesus comes after the church and the trumpet sounds, they that are dead in Christ, they that are dead in Christ, Jesus said, I'm going to quicken the mortal body and we're going to ascend and meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Sin has no more power. Sin and death has no more dominion. The devil can't stop it. Hallelujah. For whom God has made free is free indeed. Give him some praise. Give him some praise. So he says then, Christ's resurrection by the glory of the Father, and as I said, has to do with the resurrection which was affected by the power of God. Amen. His, he was resurrected by the power of God. So glory then, where it says the glory of the Father, glory is a synonym for the power of God at work. So the power of God and the glory of God are also terms for the Spirit of God. Did you get that? When you read about the power of God or the glory of God or the Spirit of God, it's all one and the same. Amen. And just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, so the believer who has been unified or united with Christ in his death is enabled by the same Holy Spirit, hello, that raised Christ from the dead to live in fellowship with God. Amen. Hallelujah. The same Spirit that raised Christ is going to raise you and I. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Romans 6 and 11, he says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So just as Jesus was dead to sin and now lives to God, so the believer should reckon on his own count or count himself to be truly dead to sin. We should not try to sin any longer. We should count ourselves dead to sin. And if I'm dead to sin, then I need to be alive to something. I need to be alive unto God. Hallelujah. That's why we come to church and the songs begin to pray and the spirit begins to move. And we say, I feel him in my hands. I feel him in my feet. I feel him all over me. Hallelujah. Why? Because I'm alive unto God. God's spirit is alive and well in my soul. So the point then, that if I'm alive to God, this is not some manner, matter of mental assent. If I'm alive, you know, I see people come to the altar and they just stand there. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to get emotional. If you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to get emotional about God. 
Because receiving the Holy Ghost is not somebody waving a wand over you. It's not me pronouncing some words over you. But the Bible says that all they that received the Holy Ghost, like they did on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Bible says they got in one mind, they got in one accord in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. They began to worship Him. They began to pray. They began to get emotional about God. Hallelujah. And as they began to worship Him, and as they began to praise Him, the Holy Holy Ghost came. Amen. And it said it filled all the house where they were sitting. <laughs> Appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all. They were all. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. So receiving the Holy Ghost is not some kind of mental ascent, but rather it's an identification with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And since it is a fact that the believer is free from the ruling power of sin, he should agree with the truth and set himself in agreement with it. If Christ be in you, we should desire to be more like Christ. And if Christ be in us, there should be some fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, and temperance. Goodness and kindness. Faith. Hallelujah. There should be some fruit. There's something wrong if you claim to have the Holy Ghost and you have a bad attitude all the time. There's something wrong if you can't smile. I'm telling myself to smile. Pretty bad if the preacher doesn't smile. I'm preaching to myself up here. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I need to set myself in agreement with the truth. It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what his word says. And therefore, whether my flesh likes it or not, I must set myself in agreement with truth. Because when I set myself in agreement with truth, then I can boldly confront temptation I can boldly claim that greater is he that is in me because Jesus has already overcome the, the evil one and if Christ be in me I can overcome the temptation and I can overcome the evil one because he lives in me praise God so Paul then brings us back to the point that all blessings we enjoy come from our union with Jesus Christ. We would not enjoy blessing if it were not for the overcomer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 12 then he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it and the lust thereof. So since the believer has been set free from sin's power, how can we refuse to allow sin to reign over us? Even though he is still in his mortal body, Paul does not suggest here that any believer during his life on earth will reach a place of perfection because there was only one that was perfect, Jesus Christ. But what Paul is suggesting is that as long as I have the power of God in me, then sin has no more ruling power over my life. Yes, I may be tempted, but I do not have to give in to those temptations. Amen. And so, what he does intend to say 
is that by the virtue of the believer's union with Christ, the believer can refuse to let sin rule over him like a king. That's not to say we'll never make a mistake, but if we do, we've got an advocate with the Father. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. So the whole point Paul is making is you do not have to become, amen, under the influence or dominant to the rule of Satan. The devil has no more power over you. The devil has no more power over you. So if you are a born-again believer, you should never say, the devil made me do it. Because that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because the devil cannot make you do it. You've been set free. Hallelujah. You've been set free. So he uses the word lust, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So that word lust means strong desire. And the word can be used either in a negative or a positive way. You can have a strong desire to the good, or you can have a strong desire to the bad. The lust of sin refers to sinful passions or desire. Amen. So sin relies upon creating within a person a strong desire for what is forbidden. When Eve looked at the fruit, she didn't immediately partake, but she looked at it, and she lusted after it, and she contemplated about it, and she thought about it a while. Until it got the best of her. And she said, I got to see what I'm missing. And all sin operates just like that. When something is dangled before you long enough, the devil will begin to suggest, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. And you And I will look at it and we'll think about it. And if we don't realize it is a temptation that the devil is setting up, amen, and we don't recognize whose voice it is that's doing the talking, amen, we will look at it and we will begin to lust after it until we end up being a partaker of it. And then when we partake of what is forbidden, then we become separated from a holy God. Because sin separates us from God. No matter what kind of sin it is. Amen. And there's just a something in our flesh that wants what we are forbidden to have. Amen. So when the believer understands that wrong desires are not his desires, but they belong to the devil or to sin, he will be helped in resisting the temptation. The, de- the Bible says in the book of James, resist the devil and he will flee. But if you open up the door to your house and invite him to come in and sit down at your kitchen table, he's going to come in and he's going to spoil your house. Amen. And so you've got enough Holy Ghost to resist the sin. And when you resist the temptation and you recognize that it is a temptation, Sin's attempt to bring you under its control will no longer have power or dominion or authority over you, but you will have more power with God as you resist the temptation. We are all tempted. Jesus himself was tempted. 
But there's got to be enough Holy Ghost in us to resist the temptation and say, no, devil, you're not coming into my house. You're not spoiling my house. This house belongs, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, I, we're going to serve the Lord. Because sin never stops with a little. Once you open the door to, a, to the devil, he comes in and takes power and dominion and authority over the whole thing. Why? Because once you give place to the devil, no matter you think, you know, we categorize a big sin, little sin, white lie, gray area, black lie. But to God, sin is sin. And once you give way to sin, you have separated yourself from God and no longer have the power. Hello? You no longer have the power to resist the temptation. And then you become a pawn in the kingdom of Satan, whether you realize it or not. Praise God. That's why it's important to have a prayer life. That's why it's important to die every day. Father, forgive me of my sins. Because he said if I confess them, that he's faithful and just to forgive them. Romans 6, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Hallelujah. Amen. So Paul then admonishes us, the Romans, not to lend their members to be used for sinful purposes. So this, of course, includes one's physical body, but it also includes one's mind, will, and emotions. I'll say that again. It also includes one's mind, will, and emotions. We are to give ourselves to Jesus Christ, or we are to give our spirit, our soul, and our body completely to the Lord. When I got the Holy Ghost, and I believe everybody had to make some kind of declaration like this, I said, God, I don't care. I give you all my heart. I give you all my mind. I give you all my soul. I give you all my strength. Everything that I am, I give it to you, God. I didn't say you can have my mind but not my soul. I didn't bargain with God. Now, some people like to bargain with God, but God doesn't bargain. You either give him all of your heart or you give him none of it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And if you give him all your heart, sin has no more power over you. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So the believer's union with Christ results in the destruction of sin's power and dominion. God does away with the power of sin over the believer. So the issue is whether sin can rule the believer. And the answer is sin cannot rule the believer if you're really a believer. The big if is whether you're a believer or not. There's a lot of people professing to be believers that are not. So the law served to illustrate the helplessness of man because the Bible tells us that we would have not known what sin was except for the law. The whole purpose of the law was to show mankind what sin was. And the law in itself could not save us. But it pointed to Calvary. 
it, the law appointed mankind to Calvary that there was going to be a Savior that would come and save us. So the law served to illustrate the helplessness of man to free himself from sin's dominion. And it tried to give us a, a set of rules or a code of conduct to live by. But since now we are under grace, sin's power is broken. And grace gives the believer both the desire and the power to do what is right. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to point out for all those that always say, well, what? bless God, we're not under the law. We're under grace. So throw the Old Testament away because you're not under the law no more. Yeah, I'm under grace. Praise God. But if you'll read in Galatians, the Bible tells us, Paul said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. Amen. Amen. God forbid that you would want to sin because sin separates us from God. So the Lord didn't just throw away the Old Testament, but he said, amen, in the New Testament, he said he would write his law in our hearts. I've got the law of God in my heart. If I've got the Holy Ghost, I've got the law of God already in my heart. I know what is right, and I know what is wrong. And if I give my body or my instruments as a member to sin, I'm a sinner. But God has already freed me from the curse of sin. So why would I want to sin? And why would I want to give my body as an instrument of unrighteousness? Because he's alive in me, I want to serve him with all my heart. With all my mind, with all my soul, it's not hard for me to serve God. I do it willingly because I'm grateful that he brought me out of the miry clay. Nobody's holding a gun to my head. He delivered us. He made us free. So sin doesn't have dominion over us any longer. Where am I at? 14 or 15? Okay, 14, I think. So the issue isn't whether or not can the believer sin. Yes, of course, any of us can sin. There was only one sinless man, Jesus Christ. We can all sin. Amen. And the law served to illustrate to us the helplessness. I already said all that. Okay, I'm at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin, he says in verse 15, because we are not under the law, but under grace? Here again, God forbid. Because I'm not under the law, I've got a license to go live however I want to live. I've got a license to do whatever I want to do. I mean, there's other denominations out there that says, well, once saved, you're always saved. If I believe that, then I'm, I'd lock the doors on this church building and stop preaching. Because I might as well just go live however I wanted to live. But he brought me out. He brought you out. He filled us with the Holy Ghost. We've been set free. We've been set free from the dominion of sin. And being set free from the law of Moses means that the believer should not sin anymore. 
doesn't mean don't obey the word of God. Amen. Doesn't mean pick the parts you like and, and throw the other parts of the Bible you don't like away. Hello? We, that's not your prerogative. Your prerogative is to submit your body as an instrument of righteousness. He said, present your body an instrument of righteousness, holy and acceptable unto God. That it is our reasonable service. How, if we claim to have the nature of God living in us, can we have fellowship with a holy God if we're living unholy? You can claim to have all the relationship that you want to claim, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible calls you. It calls you a liar. Amen. Because you can't live unholy and have fellowship with a holy God. Because unholiness separates us from God. Amen. Say amen, oh me, or something. Amen. Clap your hands so I know you're awake. <laughs> See, this stuff gets down to where we live. And as long as we talk in generalities, we're not, we don't care. Let the preacher preach all he wants. Wasn't that a great show this morning? The preacher really got with it. Hello. Well, we don't come to see a show. We don't come to hear the choir. Hello. We come to worship. And if we come and we don't worship, then we've got what we came for. That's a whole nother lesson. I got to keep going. I'm running out of time. Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So the reason believers are not to engage in sin is because in yielding themselves to sin, they become the slave to the devil all over again. Amen? And if they continue to serve sin or the sin nature, they will eventually die in their sinfulness. Amen. Or they will die separated from God because they serve sin and they did not serve the holy and the righteous God. So if on the other hand, if you yield yourselves or ourselves, to obey the leading of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, then we are going to do what is right, and therefore we become slaves of right living. I don't mind telling you I'm a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not mind telling you, I willfully give myself to be a slave to righteousness. Nobody is making me do it. I'm doing it willfully with all my heart, with all my mind, and with all my soul and strength. Praise God. Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. You have obeyed from the heart. Nobody made you do it. I will stand in this pulpit and I will preach truth. And I will preach righteousness, righteousness, I pray, the rest of my life by the help of God. But I can't change you one iota. I can't make you do anything against your will. All I can do is preach the word of God. 
And when I preach the word of God, it's up to each of you to decide what you're going to do with the word of God. Because when I stand before God, I'm going to say, Father, I preached the word to the people that you sat in the congregation. And I pray that I can do it, hallelujah, joyfully. Praise God. Amen. The Bible says we are saved by the foolishness of preaching. What we do on Thursdays and Sundays is not just an exercise or a performance or a ritual or a routine. But what we do, the Bible says, God has chosen by the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. So the reason that we preach is to turn men and women from unrighteousness to righteousness. And to obey from the heart that form of doctrine that's been delivered. Amen. God is to be thanked for the release of our captivity to sin. When we come to church, we should come in, he said, into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Why do I come with thanksgiving and why do I come with praise? Because I've been set free from the curse of sin. I've been delivered. I've got a right to come into God's house and worship him. And there's something bubbling up on the inside of my soul that said, hey, it's Sunday morning. Hey, it's Thursday night. I'm going to the house of worship. I'm going to praise my God. I'm going to say thank you, Jesus, for delivering me from the curse of sin and death. <laughs> praise God. been released from the captivity of sin I've obeyed that form of doctrine or the teaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ which has set us free from the curse of sin and death so we are saved by preaching Verse 18, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So even though we struggle with temptations, and even though we're imperfect, and there's different tensions that happen in our life, we can rest assured that because Jesus Christ, we have been made free, and we have been set free, from the dominion of sin, we have been made free, and we have been set free by the dominion of sin. Hallelujah. So the temptation can't overtake us. Amen. And the imperfections can't overwhelm us. And the tensions cannot get the best of us because I've been made free. Not only have we been set free from sin, but we have been given the power over sin's control. And therefore, we are now slaves to the Holy One of Israel. I'm a slave to righteousness. Praise God. Verse 19. I speak after the manner of men. Because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity, unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. Amen. So Paul here is encouraging them to present 
all of their resources and service to the right living. Amen. Just as they had done in the past, they presented themselves to the service of wrong living or unto uncleanliness, he says, of which he speaks of their moral impurity. Amen. They were morally impure. And they were therefore servants or presenting themselves to wrong living. Can I tell you, sin is never satisfied. Sin is never satisfied. If you yield to sin, soon you lose or sin loses its ability to satisfy our spirit or our souls. So that when it loses the ability to satisfy, I then have to increase the, de the depravity of my sinfulness. In other words, I have to sin more to get the same satisfaction. That's why a drug addict will take drugs and he won't stop with where he began, but by the time he ODs, he's taken an absurd amount of drugs. An alcoholic may start with one beer, but by the time his liver is destroyed, he is drinking a case or two a day. Because sin is never satisfied. Amen. So on the other hand, if a person surrenders to God with right living and holiness, by definition, holiness is our identification with the character of God and with his moral perfection. So wherever I start with God, it's hopefully not where I still am. Because I might have started here, but I want to end up here. Line upon line and precept upon precept. Hallelujah. I want to climb the proverbial ladder and get closer to God. So if I've been serving God for 40 years, I should have some fruit hanging on my tree. If your tree is still barren after 40 years, I fear for your life. I'm being honest tonight. I'm being serious tonight. Because Jesus walked by the fig tree and it didn't have any fruit on it. And he said, cut it down and cast it into the fire. As a type, if you will, of those that are depraved being cast into eternal damnation. So if I do not have fruit hanging off of my spiritual tree, what is the master going to say? Why did I encumber the ground for so long and bore, did not bear any fruit? That's a whole lot to think about right there. Because I have heard preachers say, unless, what did God give us the Holy Ghost for? My soul winning class on Saturday morning. God gave us the Holy Ghost to be a witness, to be a lighthouse, to be a testimony of him. So I've heard preachers say, I'm just saying I heard preachers say, that if we don't never win a soul, we may not be saved. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing to stand before the judgment seat of God and say, well, here I am, God. I made it. And he's going to say, well, where's your fruit? What do you mean? It's like the, the parable of the talent where the, the, the man went and hid his his talent in the ground. 
the, the master was angry. And I'm afraid the master will be angry with us when we stand before him if we've never won a soul for him. That's just my opinion. I'm not saying that's the gospel, but there's enough, there's enough principles in the word of God to give one concern. Amen. That is true. Amen. All right. So I want to be a servant of God. I got to hurry. 621. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So service to sin, to our sinful nature, yields no life-giving fruit. If I'm continually serving sin and not serving righteousness, I'm not producing any fruit. So the only fruit that I'm going to produce is death. Amen. Or separation from God. Amen. Romans 6.22. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. So those who have been set free from sin's controlling power have become the servants of God and thus enjoy the life-giving fruit of their behavior. Amen. Thus, it points out that genuine faith. Anybody want genuine faith? That genuine faith by which believers are saved will naturally result in right actions. If I am really saved, if I am really a believer, if I really have the Holy Ghost, then it's going to result in right actions. You can tell me you're saved all you want, but if your life does not testify of what you claim to be, there is something wrong with your Holy Ghost. Really, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Holy Ghost. I think we're just deceiving ourselves that we have the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the Bible says they'll believe a lie and be damned. Amen. Verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. So sin results again in separation from God. And union with Jesus Christ results in eternal life. Amen. So a sinner will have no basis to complain about God's judgment. Did you hear that? A sinner will have no basis to complain about the judgment of God for it will be based exclusively on what the sinner has done. But eternal life, which comes with the union of Jesus Christ, is a gift. And it is not deserved, it is not earned, it is not merited, and it is not worked for. But it is a gift which results in right living, and it is not a reward for right living. Can you say praise the Lord? The gift of God is eternal life. Amen. I want to live with him. How about you? I thank him for the Holy Ghost tonight. I thank him that I've got power over sin. That sin does not have power over us any longer. But we are the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. We have been made free. We have been set free from death and from hell and the grave and the power of the, and dominion of the devil. I'm a child of God. 
Why don't you stand, lift your hands. Let's give God praise tonight. Thank you for your power in our lives, God. Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your grace that is sufficient. I thank you because you have written your law in our hearts. You have given us the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That we might walk uprightly before you. That we might yield our members as instruments of righteousness. Hallelujah. That we're not enslaved to sin any longer. But we have become children of the living God. This world is not our home. Hallelujah. We are just pilgrims passing through. I'm glad to know there's a treasure laid up for us on the other side that we are not without hope tonight and we're looking forward to that great day when the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive and remain we will be caught up to meet you in the air and so shall we ever be with you Lord we thank you for the Holy Ghost tonight we thank you for truth and we thank you for our salvation blessed be the name blessed be the name of the Lord I give you praise I give you praise I give you praise tonight Father hallelujah thank you for your blood that was shed for us on Calvary that we might have life and that we might have it abundantly. To God be the glory. Clap your hands. Make a joyful noise unto him. Amen. God bless you tonight. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.